All right, here we are, live on another show. Uh, Shmulek Fisherman, the CEO of Argyle. We're, we're talking a little bit pre-show about about the uh, structure of the company and how you guys are 101 people in 19 companies, or 19 right. countries. Uh, how did that, I imagine when you started the company in 2018, you're thinking probably like most people back then, Hey, let's build in New York. You're in a, a major city. You could probably build a thousand person company just based on New York. When did it evolve to become remote or was it remote from the start? I'm curious that early DNA. I was previously working in San Francisco, uh, and, uh, my co-founder and CTO, uh, was working with me at the previous company. He was in London. Uh, he moved back. Uh, to all places of Vilnius, Lithuania. Um, and so by default, we were in two very different places. I had moved back to New York. Um, and because of that separation um, already built in between the two of us, um, we felt as though hiring people in different locations wasn't any different than the two of us being in two different locations. And so naturally, because of that, uh, we've just expanded globally. There is a large footprint uh, in certain geos in New York, in San Francisco, um, in Vilnius, uh, in London. Uh, but then again, there are uh, 101 of us scattered in um, many other places as well. Hmm. And how has the recruiting process worked? Has it been sort of uh, referrals or how, how has it even, even to try to get to 19 countries with 100 people is impressive. I'm curious. The first question we ask a new team member when they arrive at Argyle is who are the three people in your work experience that you've enjoyed working with the most? That is the first question we ask, and that becomes our referral funnel. It's been extremely effective. One, because people name their favorite three people to work with, um, but two, because the people that come to Argyle know other people that already work at Argyle. Um, and so it creates a really great community of people that know each other already. So you don't c come to the business um, as the newbie or the new person. Uh, you come to the business as, I know these people, which has also been really wonderful. As we scale more and more, recruiting has become a function, but a core pillar of our of our expansion is always about bringing in somebody you know from a previous job. Huh. I like that. That's really smart. Give away your secret. Uh, <laughs> you can use uh, it. The, yeah. the great news is everybody knows somebody. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. And it is true that there's kind of, there's not like 10 people you've worked with that stand out. There's usually a few. Uh, so exactly. Good question. And yeah. uh, I'm, I'm going to try to just describe using a bit of the syntax from what you have publicly available, but just for fun. So Argyle provides a uh, access point to employment data. So I think of this, in I would love to just throw this out and then you correct me sure. where this is not accurate, but you're, uh, you're maintaining a canonical or single source uh, database of the employment data. So this would be things like income level or income um, history for employees, maybe, although I couldn't quite determine if it was healthcare related, uh, and then other things. I, I want to ask you, but this is are. always a great word. Yeah. One of my what, favorite words. What, what, what's the, what's a use case maybe? How does a one company use Argo? I like the analogy of a train network. So we lay train tracks for other people to put trains and goods on them. Uh, so we don't have a database of employment records. We enable people to transmit their employment records between the custodian that has them. You can call that a Starbucks. You can call that an ADP. You can call that an Uber. But a custodian of records to a business that needs to review those records for some type of decision-making process. I need to rent a car. I'm renting an apartment. I'm trying to get a loan. I'm trying to get a mortgage. These are all businesses that need to review employment and income information in order to make a credit decision. Mm. And so we have the train network for you to transmit that information from the custodian to the reviewer. Mm. And so, so that, that means there are a lot of use cases. I was naming just a few. The list goes pretty deep. Is it is it quite fragmented, the number of use cases where there's not like a dominant single source that provides 80% of the revenue or tra or tr transfers, transactions, however you label them? To create some sizing around it, 
the IRS states that there are about 250,000 registered payroll service providers and about 800 million entities or EIN numbers that paid somebody else last year. So that's sort of the size or the fragmentation issue on the supply side of the train network. On the demand side of the, of the train network, people that want to consume this information, um, there's less business verticals, 20, 30, but obviously millions and millions of businesses that want to consume the information. Mm, interesting. So this would be an example of where, uh, oh, that's not good. <laughs> Brief intermission. <laughs> I should say that uh, Shmulek is working out of his uh, New York office, which we get to see a little brief snapshot of. You did. Back at action. Uh, back in action. All good. We're rolling with it. Uh, so this would be an example of, t this may not be a use case you're, you're working with, but say my potential uh, landlord, I'm trying to rent in, in a building yep. and they want to know my bank statements. And so typically the way that would work is I download my bank statements and then I send them to him. Well, people can edit PDFs, they can edit documents. It's not rocket science. That That is quite a fallible system. Is that kind of how you think of the business or maybe even... You are making the pitch. You are you are part of the sales team. Two yeah. components of that. Um, uh, one, the world is mired with upload the document button, right? Mm -hmm. That is super common throughout a ton of different use cases. You're constantly being told to upload documents, send documents via email. Uh, we are here to remove those buttons, those requests. The other half of it is bank statements. Uh, tell a lot about how you spend money. They tell very little about how you make money. It's a single line item that says $500 uh, deposited into your bank account. It says a lot about how you spend money, you know, gas, restaurants, flights. Important. The way that businesses make credit determinations, and to keep with that analogy about renting an apartment, if you ask uh, an apartment owner or uh, a, a real estate management firm, the way that they make decisions on uh, rental applications is your earnings capability. Do you have the ability to pay for this with your income? And that is not about a bank statement. That is about a pay stub or a W-2 mm -hmm. or a W-9. Uh, still, you have to upload the file. Uh, but the way that uh, a lot of businesses analyze that is they have to call manually your employer mm. and be like, is Schmulek really employed? Prove it. Write it out. Put, give me a letter. Um, this is a very arduous process. Before we even start talking about the fraud and manipulation component of it, it just takes a lot of work. It's the reason why a lot of people give up. Um, uh, it just, it's just, it's difficult. I've... Uh, uh, in the course of building this business, applied to work at Starbucks. It took me 30 minutes to get through that application, and I wanted the job. Um, so the, the, the world is mired with very manual, very paper-driven types of flows. Mm. I, I can see you're probably sitting there in 2018, and, and one of these experiences happened to you. Was it a anecdotal experience that sort of triggered the realization that this is much bigger than applying to Starbucks? I could sit here and make proclamations about understanding the worlds of credit. Uh, uh, we were thinking uh, very much in terms of uh, the business that we were currently at. The previous company I co-founded was a fleet management company that helped uh, Rental car companies, our, our largest client was was uh, uh, Enterprise Rental Car. Uh, that business was uh, very human hungry in the sense that you needed a lot of people to move vehicles from the airport to a repair shop, from a repair shop to a city location, from a city location back to the airport. And very high turnover at that business. Similar mm -hmm. to what happens at McDonald's, similar to what happens at Chipotle, similar to happens ha happens at Chase Bank uh, with bank tellers. And so you have to do 
uh, a lot of recruiting with a lot of applications. And those applications ask these questions. What is your first name, your last name, your marital status, your birth date? You married? You single? What was your last job? We had the same problem at the previous company. You have very low conversion rates on these forms, right? Most people don't finish them. And there's a lot of errors on these forms. And yet we ask people to fill out these forms over and over again, somehow. There should be no reason why these forms need to get filled out, was our hypothesis. What if we auto-complete somebody's application? And so the original business was called applicationautocompletion.com. We've <laughs> renamed it to something simpler. The idea was, how can we auto-complete these forms with information that is verified, with information that we know to be correct because it comes from your previous employer or your current employer? Mm -hmm. So dramatically increasing conversion, dramatically decreasing error rates. Went to start to build that business, and what we discovered was uh, what's called a pre-employment application is just the tip of the iceberg of the types of applications or types of entry points to this type of data. Lending, credit card decisioning, mortgage, rental, uh, a vehicle, the things we're talking about, uh, similar entry points. That's fascinating. So uh, your business essentially relies on integrations via the API to the payroll services. Is that a core component or maybe something else too? Our system relies on consumer consent. The owner of this data set is the worker who produced it. We should keep in mind that it's called your pay stub, your shifts. Um, so we're very reliant on consumer consent. We're a consumer consent based business. Not uh, very similar to bank aggregators. If you've used Plaid, if you've used Yodely, mm -hmm. Um, similar to other aggregators for utilities, MX, Finicity, Fiserv. These are all businesses that use consumer consent, asking for a username and a password or your credentials to log into your uh, employment portal to capture information necessary to make a determination. Hmm. We are another um, we are another aggregator in that in that lineage. Uh, we are. Uh, providing that consumer service on top of a whole host of services are some of them the run-of-the-mill household names like ADP, for sure. Um, there are, again, going back to that IRS statement, if there are 250,000 registered payroll service providers, let's just say half of them are manual, which is still astonishing. Um, we're still dealing with over 100,000 different systems of record that are the custodians of employment data. And that's everything from, um, you know, the if you're an Uber driver, you go to partners.uber.com. If you're a Starbucks barista, you go to id.starbucks.com. Uh, if you um, uh, are a YouTube creator, that's a that's another place where where um, your income and employment information is stored. So there's a, a very mm. long list um, and quite a broad list of places where where consumers have access to their own information. And is the general playbook of when you mentioned you're part of this lineage, you're drawing an analogy to the the business model of allowing consumers to log in through their portal and then extracting the data that they want automatically. Is the playbook, generally speaking, to do this if a company doesn't have an API accessible, you're essentially creating a like an iframe or a window to the user so they can log in as themselves. And then your software is recognizing the format, the template of the screen, and then you're extracting, scraping off the data from the screen. It, it, that seems like it takes a lot of maintenance because as soon as the end provider, the bank account, the API or the, uh, the payroll service updates their screen, now your scraper is broken and you have to update that. I would imagine that the evolution is that's V1 and then you move into a direct API to pull that data directly from the 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 per the custodian is that right we're quite lucky that we are standing on a good history and a lot of learnings of the companies that have come before us because we're in 2021 um almost every employer has an employee portal and they're built on very 
different technology sets without calling out good ones and bad ones. Some people say copyright 2008 at the bottom of their employee (laughs) portal, but they all have portals and all of these portals are powered by some type of API. Again, some more modern than others, but that means that we are capable of understanding the API schema that that portal operates on and interacting directly with that API. Screen scraping is um, a notion of rendering a web page and then having a computer move a mouse around on that web page to perform actions. We do not. Perf- we, mm. we we do not screen scrape. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's skipping the first part, skipping the screen scraping part of it. Yeah. So for, the, for stability, security, yeah, uh, and a, a lot of other reasons, we think that that's the right way to go. Harder, but I think the better way to go. Yeah. And generally, these companies that have the the data, they. I would imagine it's ubiquitous that they're they're providing some API access point. There's just they have to, right? Because consumers want to access their data and they're facing pressure to integrate with other tools. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Again, just because of how technology has advanced, if you are an employ if you are an employer, you're probably not um Uh, standing up a large phone bank today to have your employees call in and ask what's going to be on their next pay stub, Uh, right? You've you've developed at this point a set of tools for your employees to interact with their information online. That's interesting. Yes. It's kind of, when you describe it, it sounds very, uh, it sounds like common sense that this should be accessible. But I I suppose most people don't have the the visibility to see that there's uh, a pattern of problems that arise. It's like, I'm not facing this problem all that often. You know, you're, you're only applying to a job or jobs sometimes. And it's, it's like an entrepreneur isn't, I, I'm trying to think, why was this an opportunity in 2018? Why did the business work at this time as opposed to yeah. five years earlier? I love those sort of questions. I find them, uh, I'm always fascinating. Why does this business work today? Why didn't it get created five years ago? I, Right. There's so many businesses really like, well, that could have been that could be a great idea seven years ago. There there seems to be if I if I'm being a historian of some sort, the technology industry and the fintech industry in particular over the last 10 years has gotten very interested in expense information. If you think about the first uh, iteration of this mint.com, what Mm. was that? Let's look at your expenses. Um, and off of that, we've had a lot of what's called PFMs or uh, um, managers of finance, uh, financial applications where you can look at your finances and how you're spending your money with graphs on how you're spending your money. The, the, what that is, is essentially, if you're thinking about an individual's P&L, um, that's the P, that's the, mm-hmm. uh, or that's the, that's the L, excuse me, that's the, the loss component, right? Or how you're spending. The P or the profit part is not something that the tech industry has focused as much on. And so this is, this is the next wave of, of, of innovation around uh, getting access to income information or the, the top part of the ledger of an individual. Mm. With, with that being said, is there, it, does that paint a picture as to what's beyond? So say we have the P and the L, so people can access, there's tools for accessing and analyzing your expenses, and then there's tools for accessing and providing the rails to move your 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 profit or revenue or income uh, categories or funnels. It, does that are all the problems solved at that point, or do you feel like there's another horizon here that you're percolating on? Well, I'm sure there's always another horizon. Uh, so I, I'm definitely I, I definitely won't be the 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 one standing here saying that this is the end of it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but we're, we're just really scratching the surface of accessing income information. People typically think of income information as the person sitting at a desk, right? The, uh, the person that uh, stocks the shelves, the person that uh, drives a car. As I look forward into the future, the, the industries that I think are going to see the most uptick in in uh, workers are, are the creative industry, right? Like Mm. I, I find it fascinating 
not my generation, but there are a lot of TikTok influencers, some of which make a bunch of cash. That is income. It's not income like I know it, but it's income. Um, there are a lot of people that make a bunch of money uh, gaming online in competitive sports. That is income. Not my type of income, but it's income. And the our conception, I think, of what constitutes income, what constitutes employment or work is going to expand a lot. The The truth is there's no more of my jobs or your jobs or probably people that are listening to this podcast jobs. There just isn't that much more desk work in, on the horizon. That's mm -hmm. on the way down. Uh, what's on the way up is this uh, next generation form of work or next generation form of income. And those are the places where we want to be investing to make sure that those people as well can get access to their own income and employment information to rent a car, to get an apartment, to get a credit card, keep going down the list. Mm. Do you, I'm curious if you see that trend. So you, you touch on, uh, TikTok, YouTube, maybe, you know, other live streaming services like Twitch, uh, these are growing really quickly. People are getting more creative in their endeavors. The number of areas that number of call it sectors or interests that you can provide value, entertain people, educate people, make money are growing tremendously. I imagine even the number of platforms are going to continue to expand like Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. Uh, you know, there's probably going to right. be five more in the next 10 years that are massive at least. And each one of those are going to be significantly different um, and then allow people to be more creative. It's kind of like we're solving the problems. Like we're, we're, we're moving away from solving the, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs problems, the basic core, I need food, shelter, safety, mm -hmm. transportation. And then it's like, okay, what are we going to do when we have all those things? Well, let's just entertain ourselves. Let's just educate ourselves. Let's do what we want to do. And that sure. that's a whole different economy in, in a way, really. Everything that's new, uh, it was old is new again in a certain way. Um, mm. Is it a different economy? It's definitely a different type of income. The people are going to want to do similar things with their money. I think people are still going to want to buy clothes, rent apartments, get a car, mm. get a house. I think that those things are, are, are going to stay rather consistent. Going back to what you were talking about before, about the what problem are we solving? The number of places where you can get income is getting ever more fragmented. Yeah. And what that means is that a car dealership, right, a credit card company is going to really struggle with having a direct relationship with the numerous places that you can make money. And that is going to require an aggregator like Argyle to be their partner. So through one set of pipes, through one mm -hmm. train network, you can access all these varying types of income. And I think mm -hmm. that's the that's the change. And and does uh, crypto and blockchain play a role in this, or do you feel like that's on the distant horizon? The way I th think about blockchain technology is that it is decentralized and doesn't require uh, a, a single authority. In the U.S., that would be the Federal Reserve in order to transact. The fact that there are many types of coins, really interesting. They have different use cases, really interesting. But the central concept there is that two peers or two sides of the network can interact directly with each other through an, through an exchange, through the, through the blockchain. That is what our train network is. You can, mm. as an in, a individual, interact directly with a credit card company. You can interact directly with a rental, a, an apartment agency. You do not need to use a central authority. The central authorities in this industry are the credit bureaus. Uh, you, you'll probably be very familiar with the experience of typing in your social security number. What is taking place when, when that happens? That business is asking a credit bureau about your income and employment information. And that credit bureau is buying a ton of data on all of us and reselling it. Uh, the Fed does something similar. No, nothing against the Fed. Think it's great. But they are the central clearinghouse of moving money around. Uh, blockchain removes that need. We remove the need for credit bureaus to buy hold and resell your income and employment information. 
you are now as the individual completely in control of sharing your income and employment information with whatever business you want. And so in that way, we're, we are, we are a blockchain network of sorts. Mm. What do you think there'll be a, a, do you see or are working on a specific application on blockchain or, or is it more of a analogous similarity? I think, I think for now it's analogous. Yeah. There is a, there is a, a world in which I think our standards become a, a type of coin. I don't want to get too far ahead into the future. We have a lot. We have a lot to accomplish. But we are building a normalized uh, income and employment standard that does not exist today. One of the things that I find endlessly fascinating, did not know this before starting the business, is that there is no standard in the United States on pay stubs or on income information or on disclosures to employees about how much they make. There is no federal uh, federal regulation to even provide an employee with a pay stub, period. Hmm. The only reason why uh, people get pay stubs is because it's a benefit that employers have thought to be nice. It's also the reason why every single pay stub, if you can look at your career, looks really different. They're formatted differently. They have different information in them. There's different amounts of granularity. That's just because there's no rules on it. It's the wild, wild west of that stuff. Argyle provides a normalized, structured data set on this information. Every time you request information, it is sent to a specific specification. We do that not to be nice. We do that because it's more efficient and it's better for the marketplace. It's better for workers. It's better for businesses. Mm. And that's the same thing that goes on with with, uh, different coins that are out there as well. It, It creates a more transparent, fairer marketplace. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm so fascinated by this uh, credit bureau madness that we have. Me too. I haven't, it's, I, I, I'm familiar with how we set it up in the U.S. I don't know enough about how other countries do it, actually, but it seems like it's, even here we we have a, effectively an oligopoly where a couple of companies right. own the the rights to and, and by law there can't be other credit bureaus. And so it's like a pseudo government regulated agency that's privately owned. And obviously it's almost worse of both worlds because it, it, it's, it's government controlled and it's uh, privately, uh, privately incentivized. So they have had massive exploits, right? Uh, Equifax, Experian, uh, I forget which Benzinian. one. It was, Equifax got hacked. And there was a couple of all of Major. them have struggled quite yeah. deeply with security. Uh, I don't think that anyone is the winner on that. They're all they're all struggling on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in other countries, there's a some, sometimes if you go, I think the furthest one is if you if you look at China. China just has one credit system and it's controlled by the government. Same same thing as the Fed, by the way. It's not not radically different. The credit bureaus in the United States are, are privately owned. They do have um, a beautiful piece of legislation um, called FCRA um, that on its surface makes it seem like um, it is built for consumers. That's the C and FCRA. Um, but the, the re- legislation, and I'm a wonk on this stuff, so I've read it. Uh, the way those things are really set up is ex- exactly what you're saying. It is to shield these businesses from any type of of legal pain from an end consumer or a business, you cannot sue a credit bureau. Can't do it. And even if a credit bureau has incorrect information on a consumer, and the statistics are that about 30% of a credit bureau's file is incorrect, even if the credit bureau passes incorrect information, you can you can say to them that it's wrong. You can get upset, you can scream, you can send an angry letter, and then they'll just Thank you for notifying them of that problem. <laughs> wow. Um, and that's what that legislation is about underneath the curtain. So that to me, I'm trying to logically come to terms with how this is not just purely exploitative. Uh, and what's the, well, what's the rationale maybe when this was passed or even under the, the act? Like how does this benefit to, to give it To give it some 
easy for me and you to sit here and start listing out the bullet points of why that thing is not great. Uh, if you go to pre-internet times, and this is also the reason why there's a lot of great things about the Federal Reserve as well. If two banks needed to transact and there are 17,000 registered uh, financial institutions in the United States, how do they all transact with each other when you the only option is phones? That's very inefficient. You mm -hmm. need some governing body that where everything clears, a clearinghouse of sorts. All the banks send information in one way to send out commands to all the other ones, right? You need a ledger in the middle. Um, a credit bureau for a very long time has served a purpose there of there, again, 8 million entities that paid somebody, a lot of businesses, millions of businesses that want information on those payments. How does one make all those connections? You need a credit bureau to sit in the middle to be, again, the central authority. So there are, for legacy reasons, pre-internet, pre-technology, um, pre-digitization, a lot of paper, why you could logically understand why well-meaning, well-thinking people would create businesses like that. Uh, mm -hmm. We've also just put up a bunch of regulation and moats around those businesses that have allowed them to act in ways that that perhaps are not the best. Yeah. Um, but but I but I understand their I, I understand why we built them. We built them for good intentions. We we built the Fed for good intentions. Yeah. Yeah. And and prior to the internet, there probably isn't many uh, attack vectors other than you stealing someone's mail or literally breaking into their office and taking the paperwork. Uh, today you can you know you find one software exploitative and you're sure. in on, you know, the whole database. So it seems like the, yeah. the, the downside risk is much higher when you have uh, internet capability. Yeah. I'm always cautious to, to think that things are, are worse because of the internet um, or, or scarier because of the internet. Twas always thus that you could steal. Twas always thus that you could hack in. The method perhaps was different. People have been hacking things and breaking into things for a long time. Bank heists used to be a very big thing. Uh, yeah. but, but you are right. Uh, the internet has changed the dynamics of these types of services. Yeah. Yeah, it does seem like now, at, le at least when there's physical money in a bank or there's physical paper records, that you have to be physically present. You know, maybe you could blow the whole place up, or you know, yeah, gang there's more redundancy it. built in the system. Yeah, perhaps. you know, you you can't be in 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 a different country and go after it. So yeah, it yeah, it's pros and cons. It does seem like there's pressure to evolve. So the evolution, I think, uh, my, my take on it is that it does involve uh, blockchain. Seems to be a really relevant technology for credit in particular because yeah. people people want to have access. It seems like the ideal solution would be that. Every instead of centralizing the data, you decentralize it. Everyone owns their own keys or their own ability right. to share that data. And the data that they collect, they can always see. And when they share it, they know exactly who they're sharing it from. That's and right. The, and the security is based upon the the system at large. So similar to Bitcoin or other cryptos, it's nearly impossible to crack. That's what Argyle is. We're, we give out tools that allow you to authorize businesses to view your information. And by the way, you can do it the other way around to remove authorization for a business to uh, continue to look at your information. The information class is uh, income and employment uh, data. So could you, is there a future where Argyle or have you seen other country, companies go directly at credit bureaus and say, we're going to try to innovate on this by providing an alternative that, you know, I don't think employers need to use a credit bureau by default. They just use one because that's the best source of credit history for individuals. But I, I could see a scenario where people are providing their own credit to another blockchain based service. And then sure. kind of, you're sort of uh, well, dissolving it by not using it. Few parts of that. Um, if you're able to share your own information, you don't need to go to a credit bureau. The other component that I think is baked into that to, to this conversation is a credit score is something else than your employment and income information. A credit score is a single number that somehow defines your credit worthiness. And the only thing that I know that's different between a 600 
and a 550 is that 600 happens to be a larger number than 550. <laughs> Other than that fact, I do not know the difference between those two numbers. And you want to know what? No one else does either because no credit bureau will tell you why you got a 550 instead of a 600. Interesting. Why? A why is it? Why? Why does it have to be so vague? It's What's a, the incentive? It, because it's a because it's a proprietary formula that uses many different signals to derive a score that understands your creditworthiness. Of course, um, I hope that joke works. <laughs> I'm putting on my black hat here. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting, though, when you go talk to uh, credit card companies, lenders, uh, 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 real estate owners, what you will hear from them continuously is. I need to use the credit score because it's the best I got, but I'd love to be able to make my own score. Please give me the raw data set. I'm an adult. I mm. can do this myself. I would like the raw data set, please. That is what Argyle is. We will give you the raw data set. You, you run credit decisioning, right? And I posit that um, businesses have different, um, uh, you know, uh, bands of what they are going to accept and not accept. They're going to want a certain class of people based on how much income they make, uh, job title, seniority, length of time at work. There's a ton of information that you can use for credit decisioning. Everybody, everybody should be allowed to make their own credit score. It's, it's not a monopoly on credit score generation. Um, and when you ask businesses, if you were given to option, take the whatever 550, 600 or build your own, they go with the build your own. Yeah. And that's what Could, we're providing. And so does Argyle have the, or is planning on building, uh, the tools to say, this is what I, this is the type of employer I am now here are your suggested, you know, calibrations. Maybe I can set some levers and say, what's a priority to me. And then it, kind of customize that? Uh, so philosophically, morally, and also from a business standpoint, I want to make sure that Argyle is not generating scores. We mm. are train tracks. We allow you to move information from a custodian to a business that wants to evaluate it. That business that wants to evaluate is going to score you. They're going to score you differently than any other business because they have the raw data to score. But I don't want Argyle to become a business that is generating scores because then we're doing nothing better than what the credit bureaus are doing today. We are generating a score. I'm not, I'm not the arbiter of your situation. I'm the train tracks that allow you uh, the tools and the power to decide who gets to look at your information or not. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I want to, that's a, that's a good business. Uh, that's a business I like. I want it to end there. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's really up to the people who are getting the data to make the calibrations yes, and what matters. Because that's what, that's what the credit bureau is doing. When you get a 600 instead of a 550, they're saying, oh, well, he requested his credit five times in a row in the last month and every time yeah. 10 mm -hmm. points or whatever their, their score is. And the score probably doesn't align, right? There's somebody I would absolutely hire to work at my donut shop, but he's showing up as a low credit score because he's you know, Something. requested a, a car loan seven times and that has nothing to do with his ability to work here. So you it's got a, it. you're effectively pointing out that there's a miscalibration that the people providing the data, namely in this case, Argyle and the credit bureaus have a common, a shared thing that they do there where they're providing the data, but the, the credit bureaus are cloaking it and sort of condensing it into just one number. And so yeah, I, I don't, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to separate out the sentence of Argyle and a credit bureau, but, um, <laughs> uh, uh, you are right. There's a there's a cloaking or mirage uh, component to what credit bureaus do today. So, what's the future there? Do you see it as as kind of dissolving over time? As uh, other, I do. Yeah, I do. I I also things always take a lot longer than you think they do. So this is a five ten year journey. But over the long term, do I believe that credit scores become less important? Yes. Over the long term, do I think that credit bureaus um, have less of a business to provide? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems to me just anecdotally from 
businesses I've run, people I've hired, friends who have hired other people, credit scores aren't used. I mean, really the primary means is reference checks, uh, skill, technical assessments, and conversations. It's like so those seem to be the biggest. I would. So I think that that's correct. And I, uh, since we're having fun, I'm going to, I'm going to use you and me in a joke. Um, we're the lucky ones. There's almost none of us. Uh, 70% of the U S population is shift and hourly based. Um, nearly all of the U S population makes less than a hundred thousand dollars a year. The truth is, is that for most people, uh, a $500 extra expense every month would make them, uh, have a bank account balance of zero. Uh, moral aside on on how we pay people, and I think that we should pay people a lot more um, around the world. Um, most people are dependent on credit scores because that is the way that they're able to rent a car, mm. which is very important. We get to live in the information economy, which is really fun. In the uh, you know we're um, we're workers that get to talk about things, build things. Um, most people are living paycheck to paycheck and most people are reliant, dependent, controlled by these bureaus that allow them to uh, have a credit extension, get a credit increase, right? They're not evaluated for a Starbucks barista job based on their, you know, how nicely they talk on a podcast. That's not how mm. it works mm. uh, for the majority of Americans. Do, uh, do you... Do you see the solution there? Uh, and inherently by this question, I'm implicating the problem. But do you see the solution being more government intervention and uh, incentives and programs or less? Do you see the government as the problem or the solution? So I, th I, um, I think regulation in this area is really important, particularly around uh, uh, income and employment data standards. I think that there needs to be a lot more regulation and standards. Um, a great example of that is um, gap standards for publicly traded companies. The reason why we do that is not because um, we want to make things more complicated for accounting teams. We do that because we want to make sure every single business is evaluated based on the same set of numerical values. We should have gap standards for employment data. Um, HIPAA does the same thing. You could keep going down the list in different industries. The part I worry about, about government providing a score, is that does feel um, quite China-esque, uh, mm. where, again, then the government is generating a score. I'm not quite sure we want that either. Um, I, don't, I, I, I think we want to get away from single authorities generating your worthiness or unworthiness of something, um, because... That's, um, you know, that's the analogy of the Fed and the reason why people are so interested in Bitcoin. How do you remove the government from that? Mm. But regulation, I, I think, is desperately needed in this space. And, and do you think, uh, and my, my views are still in process here, but whether the government should uh, take money from its uh, taxable income that it has and then give it out freely to people who have uh, either across the board universally under UBI or, I mean, let's start with UBI seems like the most um, pushed idea and it, it seems yeah. to have some some gravitas. Certainly after COVID, there has been effectively a UBI program in place where we're printing in money and giving it out. Uh, I, I'm not sure that it's that it's caused by or or really has much to do with the, the dis, um, dissolution of jobs. I mean, that's kind of the narrative is like, machines are taking our jobs and so therefore we need this i i'm not sold on that premise but it does it does seem like the the astronomical wealth inequality c needs to be addressed somehow and that might be less sure. regulation i think uh, we have a lot of we have very, we have massive books on regulation and a lot of entrepreneurs don't start people don't leave their companies because of healthcare, of co in inability to move sure so, so I, i'm curious your take I'm not a politician here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the, those conversations out. I do think, though, that it's important to evaluate people on, on metrics that aren't solely about how much money you make. Uh, to, to bring it back to Argyle, mm. uh, one, of the, 
one of the um, common things that we coach our clients through is instead of looking at just income, to look at on-time performance. Does this person reliably show up for work or reliably produce work? If you think of like a Patreon worker, are they reliably producing more content? That is, um, if you start thinking about scoring, those are reliable people that are likely to repay their car payment. I would say are more likely to repay their car payment. Um, not strictly about how much money you make, uh, but, mm -hmm. but a way to uh, cut the problem differently. And I, I think mm -hmm. that there's a lot of that out there. Are you, um, are you staying at, are you changing your job every three months or are you, are you able to work your way up at a job? These are things that, again, not about money, um, but, but other ways to evaluate people. And I, I think that that's important, mm -hmm. particularly in an economy like ours, where again, there aren't more desk jobs. Yeah. Um, so we, we need other tools. Yeah, I agree, man. It feels like there's, there's a lot of people, I don't know if it's people don't, don't have access to, maybe a set, let's start from this. They, so a lot of people don't see that there is potential to create value on the internet. They don't, they don't, they're not exposed to it. They're not inspired sure. by it in any particular way yet vast majority of people i would imagine even under 100k have smartphones so they could create content it's they're not yeah. physically limited by doing it and i think a lot of it is is being able to see someone close to you do it or have some kind of inspiration but even now we have we have social media and there's people saying here's how to yeah. do it there's youtube and, and things so i, I wonder what why if there is this class of people who are making tons of money and creating a lot of value in the creator economy, but there's no, there's no physical, there's no financial, and there's really no cultural or societal limits to who can enter that game. The That's people right. who are, uh, I think of the, like the people who are in the, the hourly clock in clock out game that are struggling and are want to get out of that. Yeah. Are we just gradually moving to uh, a place where people are, are jumping in the, the internet economy. And I mean, maybe, maybe there's an illusion in that there's not a systemic problem or wealth inequality is just the way things are today as the in, in, internet is premature. And so as the internet yeah. grows, crypto grows, that will naturally uh, balance out where people have, I mean, does any of this make sense or vibe with you? <laughs> well, it, it, it definitely aligns with, with what we're seeing transmitted on our train tracks, which is that, uh, Sarah, the barista at Starbucks is also Sarah. The Uber driver is also Sarah, the pellet, uh, the, mm. the Patreon artist. Uh, we see, uh, in growing and growing numbers, people have four types of income, five types of income, six types of income. I commonly tell our clients the idea of Don Draper, um, being the person that is filling out your application is very unlikely, right? You need to start thinking about the next generation of people that you don't interact with all the time, but are the people that are going to be interacting with your business. I mean, those are people that make money from a lot of different sources and the logos are not the ones you're used to, right? Um, they're not making money at Lockheed Martin, right? Um, and that's the that's the part to start getting businesses comfortable with. That's a conversation. Mm. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad that we're a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. Um, yeah. I, I find that I find that like the political conversations to be ones that we're all in trouble if we default to just politicians deciding on them. So yeah, yeah part of the thing I think about is like, you're a very smart guy. You have a very unique insight. Part of the part of these conversations, I think, is helping people understand helping people understand what the arguments are on both sides. Not yes. trying to pitch or sell anything, but seeing the trends that you see. Whereas, like people are working more jobs or working more creative jobs, yes. that indicates other things. Like it indicates a, changes in the economy that are going to have probably predictable if you think about them patterns and trends. I. Uh what we find ourselves doing most with clients is being a consultant, being a teacher, mm. being a storyteller and communicating to the, the generation above me and the generation uh, about the generation uh, that is below me. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and teaching them just what is the world like today? How do you want to build a business around that? That is going to be compatible. 
Yeah. Um, and you're right. That's not about politics. It's not about like having so much as an opinion, but doing an educational session with people that need the education. Yeah, that's that's interesting. You guys raised uh, about 22, 23 million. Uh, that's exactly how much I raised my, my last business. Uh, you are <laughs> focused now clearly on the core components of what you're doing and everything we talked about. Do you see the trajectory of the next five years as continue to build out what you've already started and just elaborate on that that playbook? sell the company to definitely not, not going to be selling this one. That's that, that, uh, that one's, that, that one's not on, on my, uh, 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 that, that one's not in my mind. Um, I do think that this is a global problem. We already have clients in Canada and in the UK. Um, um, I, I, uh, if you go look at other geos, um, there's a version of Argyle in France. There's a version of mm. Argyle in, in India. There's a version of Argyle in Latin America. Uh, kudos to um, the one in France and in India for copying our API set. And I don't mean that as a joke. Thank you for using the same employment standards. I think that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Oh, interesting. Um, um, so I think this is a global problem. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of expansion there. And the second is, is that we have a lot of work to do, uh, to be talking with, um, what I would call data custodians again, you know, the ADPs, the Walmarts, uh, the YouTubes about how to be part of this journey as well. We need them to, um, be part of our network. Um, and so that, that means that we need to build tools and services for them that are just as compelling as the tools and services we're building for consumers and for businesses, like again, lenders, credit card companies, those, mm. those, uh, and the list goes on. Yeah. So the so, lot more so building for us. Yeah. One thing we didn't even touch on that I, I think about is like the type of data that's not accessible or the type of data that like, um, like race, age, I think you could ask age, you can ask birthday, um, yeah, there's there's some data that we deem is okay, and there's some we say you can't ask this. This is forbidden, and I think that that line is like interesting to see how it evolves over time. Uh, totally, it's like it, it largely reflects the values of society, what we care about. Totally, and um, the yeah the 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 small bit on that is again, if the consumer is authorizing, if you give the consumer yeah. control, this is this is the real thing. Some people might be okay with sharing that. Some people might not be. Great. Mm. Let's let them make that choice, right? Yeah. Uh, instead of having a blanket all statement, right? Instead of uh, having the government say what's good or bad, right? Um, one size doesn't fit all. Let people decide. Um, I think that's a, I think that's I a good ethos that. to have. I totally agree with you. Uh, <clears throat> this has been a real pleasure. I, I've learned yeah, a ton has. from from this conversation. Shmulek, man, congrats on all the progress. I hope Thank to you. Uh, have you back someday. I, I presume IPO or maybe buying other companies or running this till you die is one of the options. <laughs> well, all of the above, and, and we'll, <laughs> I'll come back and talk to you about it. Awesome, man. Well, uh, is there anything else that you guys are looking for, uh, either raising or hiring specific people or anything else that's sort of top of mind internally? Please come to our careers page. We're, we're, we have uh, many, many open roles. Um, if there are, uh, if you are, if you use a credit bureau today, please come and talk to us. <laughs> there is a better way. Um, and no, it was, it was great talk with you. Awesome, man. Take care, everybody.